Yes. And 
sing some songs. I tell you folks, I'll work for you until I drop. Oh, you all shout for God's sake, stop. All I do is start to chat. Tom's son 
to a happy good drink. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Angelina Jolie said, they say I'm the most beautiful woman in the world. And Tom Thomas said, they say I'm the smallest man in the world. And Dave Quasimodo said, they say I'm the ugliest man in the world. And they thought, let's have a laugh. Let's all go to the Guinness Book of Records and be interviewed and see if we can get in the book officially. So they go for their interviews. Angelina comes out, beaming, said, it's established I'm the most beautiful woman in the world. Tom Tom came out and said, I've cracked it. I'm the smallest man in the world. Cosimodo went in and came out and said, who's Alan Sugar? <laughs>
No, but remember that sheep? Farmer said, that sheep's a liar. <laughs> <laughs> a brilliant young ventriloquist called Dennis Spicer. Oh, he was yeah. superb, but we lost him too soon. It was very sad. But on a happier note, we were in uh, Newcastle, Time Tees Television, and this dates the story delightfully. Ted Ray was there, the great comic, and uh, Dennis Spicer hadn't turned up. And this is long before mobiles and all that. And they brought his wife, his agent, they said he left ages ago. Finally, Dennis erupted into the room and said, Oh, the traffic, sorry about that. And he opened the case, I'm not making this up, and he took out a little ventriloquist doll, and there was a sort of hook on the wall, and he hung this little doll on the wall and said, sorry, I must have a pee and a cup of tea, I'll be back in a minute. And he went out of the room. And Ted Ray said, we're all professionals, we shouldn't look in Dennis's case. Let's have a look. <laughs> and he opened the lid, and there was a, a duck with rolling round eyes, and a frog with funny legs, and a snake, and we were looking. And then Ted said, no, we should be doing this, and closed the lid. And Dennis came back in the room, and the doll on the wall said, he's had a look in your case. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, I saw a topless special quiz the other week. Never saw the lips move. <laughs> Miss Barnett, who used to live in the avenue, just there, and uh, she had a, she would live to a great age, great woman, and she uh, had a dog called Bobby, who she used to pop out for his ritual pee at night. And one night, Miss Barnett had been up west painting the town red, and she got home pretty late, 1 a.m. or something, and uh, Bobby was at it with a bitch from down the road, <laughs> and she shouted, and she got a bucket of water, and shone a light and got a broom and she said, she forgot what time of night it was, so she rang our local vet, who answered the phone. Mm. She said, Miss Barnett. Mm. She said, do you know my dog Bobby? Yeah. She said, well he's at it with the, the bitch and I've shone a light and shouted out a problem with the broom and I don't know what to do. And he said, bring him to the phone. <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, that stop him. He said, it's just stop me. Now. <laughs> 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 And I said, it's Barry. 
hello Barry, and I sat down, we're chatting. He said, uh, you're often at Harrow on the Hill Station, aren't you? I said, uh, yes. He said, so am I. I said, I've never seen you there. He said, I've never seen you there. <laughs> <laughs> there was a mime act in Edinburgh, I've just done the fringe again, but I could do anything at my age, <laughs> out with my mate. And uh, they told this story, this man's doing his mime, you know, trapped in a glass box, walking in the wind. And after a few minutes, the voice in the audience said, for God's sake, tell a joke, I'm blind. <laughs> <laughs> and a few minutes later, the same voice said, has he gone? <laughs> Another letter. S. S. Now, go on. Like S. Okay. Right. S. Uh, oh, now here's a forbidden subject. S for smoking. Have some proper horrid ones, so put your hand up and smoke. And they won't. Quite right. But I heard this story. A guy was smoking a cigarette outside the pub, and an officious back came up and said, Can't you see that sign? You can't smoke within six feet of the pub. He said, I'm drinking at the one up the road. <laughs> Satisfy me. <laughs> Bernard Matthews turkeys, Norfolk and good. Uh, S S. Uh, oh, uh, signs. I saw a sign in Edinburgh that said, "Watch batteries fitted here." <laughs> well, that's not much of a spectator sport. Uh, S S. Oh, school. Talk about your school. Oh. Tell us about your school days, Uncle Baz. Well, <laughs> my school days, I mean, we, we, we were taught that's it, looking back. You know, we didn't, uh, and I still remember transmitting my source of Caledonia. Beam me up, Scotty. You know. <laughs> I remember Bruce Wilkinson, yeah. who used to, um, this is true, in those days, used to whack us behind the knee with a chair leg. And it didn't hurt at the time, but then the sting and the pain, you know, it came on later. Bruiser was obviously a nickname. Her real name was Sister Teresa. Got <laughs> 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 to Louis here? Oh, yes. Yeah. Your great friend at school. Yeah, my great maid at school. I have to paint the background here. Uh, because a rabbi in North... I'm not Jewish, and I, a rabbi in Northwood called me Henri Jew, friend of the family, which I thought was lovely. And we just sat loud and talked. And I told him what I'm going to tell you now. My introduction to Jewish humour was Leeds Grammar School all those years ago. Louis Lippmann became a mate of mine. And he got me into this wonderful world. And boy, was he funny. We had a maths class from afternoon. And the master said, uh, Lippmann, what's 8% of 57 pounds? He said, exactly, sir. What's 8%? <laughs> the vicar and the rabbi, the three old friends, would meet and have a laugh and talk. And one night the subject turned to this, uh, the conversation turned to the subject of miracles. Did they happen in real life? And the priest said, I think they do. He said, I was in a little light plane once with some parishioners and we were hit by an electric storm. He said, I was terrified. Under the sea belt I knelt in that rolling plane and I prayed. Suddenly for a hundred yards around, the sky was calm and got back to the ground. I think that's a miracle. And the vicar said, oh, this is weird. I said, I'll tell you a story. He said, I was on a little trawler off Grimsby, quite a small one. We were hit by a terrifying storm in the sea, he said. And I knelt on the heaving deck and I prayed. Suddenly for a hundred yards around, the sea was calm. We got into the port. I think that's a miracle. And the rabbi said, this is getting really weird and spooky, he said. I was making my way to the shul, the synagogue, on our Sabbath, and I saw outside the synagogue a big zip-up bag, hold all the burst open, there was money all over the pavement. I'm not allowed to handle money on our Sabbath, so I knelt and prayed, and suddenly for a hundred yards around, it was Wednesday. <laughs> Father rang his son David in New York and he 
said, hello, Dad. He said, sorry to tell you, your mum and I are getting divorced. He said, Dad, it's over 45 years. He said, okay, that's it. Just telling you, no discussion, put the phone down. David's very upset, always knew. Rang his sister Shirley in Brisbane. He said, Dad's run up, saying he and Mum are getting divorced. She said, David, that's awful, leave it with me. She finally gets the father on the phone. She said, David's run up, said you and Mum are getting divorced. He said, yes, I was obviously going to ring you, uh, but that's it, no discussion. She said, there will be a discussion, Dad. David and I are coming home, we'll have a family conference and talk this thing through. He said, all right, he put the phone down. Turned to his wife and said, they're both coming home for Passover and they're paying their own fares. <laughs> Somebody shout out a Christian name, their own, or somebody's Christian name, and Colin I'll try and do a song with that name in it. Michael! Michael! Raphael! Raphael, Michael, nothing personal, that was a bit too easy. Raphael! Raphael! Let's... Oh, bear with us for a minute. Here's a song with Raphael's name. <laughs>
classic television, local news, no weather forecast, live obviously, no technology. The weather forecast was a board on an easel with a letter stuck on with Velcro. And one night on the news, he said over to our local area weather forecast, which was fog. And the camera went over there and the app had fallen off. <laughs> and all the viewers saw was this wonderful word, fog. And the camera went back to the news and said, Sorry about the epic <laughs> Chefs? Oh, chefs. Yes. Chefs, restaurants? Yes. Ah, right. A man went into a restaurant and uh, bought an Aylesbury duck. And they brought the duck and he did that at the beginning up the parson's nose of the duck. He said, This is not Aylesbury duck. This is not the country or something. He sent it back. It was furious. Another Ellsbury duck arrives and he goes, Oh, come on, he said, this is south coast or something. By now you can imagine the atmosphere. A third Ellsbury duck. <coughs> ah, you finally got it right, he said. Congratulations. And he carved it and took a taste and said, Not only have you got it right, this is one of the best Ellsbury ducks I've ever tasted. I would like to compliment the chef. And the furious chef comes out of the kitchen and the man compliments him and they chat away. And the man said to the chef, where are you from? And the chef dropped his trousers and said, you tell me, you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to uh, the news quiz, my member went back to the place when I used to do it and everything. Alan Corrin, my mate, was the chairman and everything. And this was uh, Alan's favorite joke. The village south of Warsaw in Poland, obviously, and uh, the village cow died, and there was a crisis meeting, and uh, led to the village round the table, put your slotties on the table, we've got to get a new cow, <coughs> and they got about 300 slotties. And somebody said, you won't get a decent cow for over 500. And one of the guys said, my brother-in-law lives in Minsk, I'll go and ask him. And he came back so we can get a good cow from Minsk for 300 slotties. And the new cow arrives. And it is an enormous success. The milk and the cheese and everything better than the old cow. And there's another meeting round the table. We could make this cow with a you know a bull from a neighbouring village. Yeah. Negotiations, and this very priapic bull arrives. And the whole of the poor cow still. And the bull charged in and she went to the left and the bull tripped. Hold that cow still. Bull charges in again, she goes to the right, the bull stumbling. The whole village is holding this poor cow still. And the bull charged in and she went like that and the bull fell over. Crisis, what are we going to do? Here we go again. The, the rabbi is the wise man, we will tell her about this. And they told, got the rabbi to come along and they told him all about the bull and the cow and what had happened. And the rabbi looked at the cow and said, that cow is from Minsk. And they said, rabbi, you're amazing, how can you tell? My wife's from Minsk. <laughs> After Tom left us, I worked with him a lot, but I heard about a joke he told, which I didn't remember him telling when I worked with him, and I loved it. I'm in a queue at a post office, and a man in front of me is holding a banana up like that, or like that. And I said to him, why are you holding that banana up? And he looked and said, oh no, I've eaten my gun. <laughs> Tom was in the guards for his army service, maybe the last guards or not, I don't remember, but the story was, he's standing outside, 70 box with his rifle, and he fell asleep standing up, he'd gone. And he opened half an eye, and there's his sergeant major looking at him very sternly. And Tom closed his eyes, and then opened them again and said, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> this hyena, <laughs> I don't know why I'm shouting, I've got the job. <laughs> this hyena talking to a gorilla, and the hyena said, I'm fed up. And a gorilla said, You're fed up. And a hyena said, I've just said that. So the gorilla said, Why are you fed up? And the hyena said, When I take my morning constitutional, 
you should have heard Tom say that word for a start. <laughs> well, I'll turn my morning constitutional. This lion keeps jumping out the jungle and beating me up. I'm fair. And the hyenas said, if I ever see it happen, uh, the uh, gorilla, I should have said, James <laughs> Carrington, the gorilla, the gorilla. <laughs> the gorilla said, if I ever see it happen, I'll intervene on your behalf. The next day, the lion was taking his walk, shoot it up, lion jumps up, beat him up, boom, boom, boom. Lion runs off. Hyenas lying there going, uh. And he looked up, and the gorilla's sitting on the branch, very nonchalant. And the hyenas said, you told me if you ever saw it happen, and you'd intervene on my behalf. And the gorilla said, well, you were laughing so much, I thought you were winning. <laughs> That's better without an interval. <laughs> Uh, and, oh, uh, countdown. Oh, yeah. Countdown. In the old days, here he goes again, Richard Whiteley and Carol Alderman and all that. And two older guys were talking, and one said to his mate, uh, Oh, I was watching Countdown yesterday. I looked at Carol Alderman, <coughs> got aroused. His mate said, That's good. He said, It's only seven letters. <laughs> <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. I'll paint in the background. We were a cosy middle class family, but I loved the black sheep, the maverick, Uncle Norman. Cloth cut roll up saws down the pub. I loved him. And uh, he was a great character. He used to say amazing things. He once said, I can forgive, but I can't knit. Mm. <laughs> 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 little knowing either of us, I was going to become a writer years later. He actually said it to me once. He said, when you're writing someone, you've got to have the right word in the right place. The more shoes, he said. Right word in the right place, otherwise it doesn't work. Years later, I was writing a script, and I got a complete mental block. And I tried to think of the right word for two weeks. And then I thought, fortnight, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Sherlock Holmes in all this, you're asking. <coughs> Norman introduced me to the world of Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes. And last year, one of the national papers, news was a bit slow, they did a sort of light-hearted item, the great jokes, you know, vote for your jokes. No such thing. Good jokes, bad jokes, jokes you like, jokes you don't. Anyway, they predicted this list of ten. Number one, Sherlock Holmes. And this was the joke, the apparent great joke. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are coming out on Dartmoor. And Holmes said to Watson, Look up, Watson, what do you see? He said, I see a clear night sky, Holmes, a full moon and nearly every star visible. God is in his heaven and all is bright with the world. And Holmes said, You're an idiot, Watson. Some bastards make the tent now. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about home and, and Leeds and Yorkshire. Talk about your, your father. Who sometimes do that. <coughs> oh, well, my dad used to come home from work covered in coal dust from oh, head to foot. Yeah. And I watched my mother getting the tin baths ready and put the fire, and I'd stand there watching him sitting in the tin baths, washing coal dust top himself. Never knew why. He was an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> he used to tell the story of the accountant walking down the street, the poor old tramp of Dosser came up and said, give us a quid down to for three days. And the accountant said, hmm, how does this compare to the same period last year? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hypochondriac. Yes, go on. Well, I have to come. I'm, I'm a hypochondriac, or so my gynecologist told me. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Hope, then, somewhere. Bob Hope? That's I'm working him with my yeah. foot. <laughs> Tell the story. <coughs> Excuse me, welcome to the sound of mucus. Um. <laughs> Bob Hope uh, said in his early days, making his way through Bordeville and everything, he worked with a guy, a sensational act, a man who wrestled an alligator in a tank of water in front of the audience. And he said, I used to watch it every night, it was amazing. He said, Look, one night it wasn't that good, it was a bit listless and everything, and I'm with a guy in the bar afterwards. 
And he said, what happened with the alligator tonight? And the guy said, tonight? It died on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Which reminded me of when I, when I was bottom of the bill, almost years ago in variety theatres, there was a great Del Monte and his dancing duck. And it was an ornithological act. Birds playing football and on trapezes and all sorts. But the big finish, the music swelled spotlight. A duck tap danced on a biscuit tin. And it was a really big finish to the act. It was wonderful. <coughs> and I watched it nearly every night. And then one night, like the Bob Hope story, the duck was very sort of listless, nothing much, and very faint applause from the audience. And I thought, oh boy. And I was with the great Del Monte in the bar afterwards, all wretches we knew him. And uh, I said, what happened to the duck tonight? He said, oh, the candle went out. <laughs> <laughs> Can I lead on from that into something not unrelated, just about things not working? If I say the word Sten Gun to you... Sten, Sten Gun? Oh, he's getting me on the spot here. Sten Gun, the small arms. Ah, yes. Our boys were in Norway during the Second World War in their Arctic conditions, and they had the Sten Gun, the short arm, and it used to freeze up overnight and not fire in the morning. And one of the lads, almost as a joke, got a Durex condom, stretched it over the barrel of his stand gun, peeled it off in the morning, and the gun fired the first time. This story went up the chain of command, and it was mooted that the Durex company made an 18-inch model to use on stand guns. And the great Winston Churchill was consulted about this, this 18-inch condom, and he said, I'll sex it on two conditions. One, they are clearly marked made in Britain. <laughs> and two, medium size. Train of thought, Winston, Winston. Yeah. I went to the nightclub called Winston's with a great Danny LaRue. And poor Danny had his own club. And uh, it was at rehearsals for this nightclub. This is true. I met my wife and Ronnie Corbett on exactly the same day. Tossed a coin and married her. No? <laughs> Winston's was the club. And uh, it just an amazing era. And then Danny had his own club. But people who came to see him, the Beatles and Bertrand Taylor and Judy Garland one night, and Princess Margaret and Armstrong Jones and all this was going on. And an old coward used to come to Danny's club. And a, a caustic, witty man, but when you got to know him, he was very sort of popular, warm and funny, but he couldn't switch off. No. They told us he'd been cornered by a man before the show who had a few. And this man said to Noel Carr, I passed your house last night. And Noel Carr said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they told us he was rehearsing one of his plays. He wasn't in it, he was directing it. And they had a sort of tea break, and one of the actors, Noel noticed, was giving his nose a deep and enthusiastic pick. And Noel said, give me a wave when you get to the bridge. <laughs> there must be a curse on uh, doing Go With The Wind as a musical. They tried it a year or so ago, and it didn't work. And back in the 70s, they tried it. Big actor, Harve Presnell, and June Ritchie, the actress, a very spectacular, Musical of Gone with the Wind, with a revolving stage. Bonnie Langford played the little girl, a real horse, the fire of Atlanta and everything. No account of friends went to the first night, which sadly was a disaster. The fire got out of control, the revolving stage stuck, the horse obliged all over the stage, and everything's going wrong. And they're walking out, and somebody said, uh, What do you think, Noah? He said, I think the two main problems could have been solved by sticking the little girl up the horse's arse. Bonnie Langford tells that story herself. So this time. <laughs> Noel Coward became, with all his great songs, a cabaret act. But one of his most famous uh, things he used to do wasn't originally written by him. It was written by his friend and contemporary Cole Porter, who gave Noel Coward license and dispensation to mess about with the lyric. So here tonight, for you lot, here in Hatch End, this is my salute to those two great men. Cole, Nick is still wet here. Cole, 
Let's do it. <laughs> Let's give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> 